Heritage International Headquarters in Fort Mill, South Carolina. This is Prophetic Perspectives on Current Events with Rick Joyner. I tell you, this year, I think we're going to see the church and church life become what it is supposed to be. Thank you here. And we're uh, also, you know, I know most Christians are not in a local body. I just ask you to find the place of Koinonia. You, you can't abide in the light as he is in the light unless you have koinonia. That's what it clearly says in 1 John 1, 7. You can't be rightly joined to the head without also being rightly joined to the rest of his body. So I just ask you to consider this year finding that place of fellowship. And I know a lot of you are in places where there is nothing anywhere close to you with this koinonia going on. And many of you are part of our cyber church now, but you know what we'd like to do for the cyber church is sometimes be a stopgap and a place where you have teaching and ministry. We do have ministry teams that are gonna start ministering to our cyber church members and all. But uh, <clears throat> you still need to have that, even if it's just in your own family. Our few friends that you, you get together intentionally about but I think you're going to see a compelling um, drive and a, a hunger rising back in God's people. Get in the body of Christ where you're supposed to be. You've got to fit together with the rest of the body. That's essential. Now, here's another good question from Lydia Harrelson. What is your opinion of the effect of the Johnson Amendment 501c3 on churches in the United States? Well, I think it was devastating to the most superficial churches, which may have been most of the churches. 501c3 was the Johnson Amendment, tax, you know, uh, forming tax-exempt organizations, which, by the way, no church has to be a 501c3 organization. It's not required for a church. A church is automatically tax-exempt according to the law. So you, churches don't need that, but the Johnson and the IRS has tried to imply that they did because the 501c3 regulations put all kinds of, <coughs> I think, illegal, unconstitutional shackles on the church, and it was tended, intended to be that way. My understanding is that that was the purpose for which Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson, had these written. He was so fed up with the churches attacking him, churches standing up against what he was trying to do in his agenda, that he wanted to silence them. He wanted to throttle them. Now, the, way I, the reason I say this really had a major negative effect on superficial churches, I don't think any true pastor let that control them at all. Even the threat. First thing, no church has ever lost its tax-exempt status for speaking out on the elections or anything else, you see it all the time. I mean, you see inner city minority churches all the time endorsing candidates, everything else that many, for some reason, other churches feel like they can't do, or the IRS is gonna come get them. The IRS has never come to get anybody. Even though some of these things may violate some of the basic code and all, they, they know that code's unconstitutional. And if it ever got tested in court, the whole thing would get thrown out. They don't want to test it, but they're using it to shackle churches and church leaders. But I don't think any true shepherd ever let that shackle them. True shepherd lays down their life for the sheep. They would say, I'd rather lose 
my tax exempt status, my buildings. I'd rather lose everything I have than compromise the truth that I've been entrusted with to give to God's people. So I'm just saying, but I know, you know, Donald Trump picked up on how this has throttled the churches. He wants to deal with it. He wants to get rid of the 501c3 thing for churches and for any Christians. I mean, I was there with him when he he said, you know, bums on the street have more authority than pastors because the bum on the street can say what he thinks and what he wants to say. And there's no penalty, but pastors and churches can't speak out against a lot of things. They can, because it is an unconstitutional, a whole lot of that 501c3 is unconstitutional. I, I'm a part of a, you know, pulpit freedom movement at least once a year. I try to do it every Sunday. I don't intentionally try to violate the law, but once a year, thousands of pastors in America intentionally preach sermons that violate certain IRS code and and uh, <clears throat> regulations under the 501c3 and then send those messages to the IRS and say, I did this, come and get me. Because they want to test it in court because they know it's unconstitutional, but the IRS has never tested any of them. Okay. Um, there's a whole lot more we could say about that, but I think in other countries too, you see all kinds of shackles, but true Prophets, true shepherds are never going to be shackled by stuff like that. Just like the true, the first apostle said, we will obey God rather than men. We want to honor authorities, as we're told in Romans 13, but when it comes to a conflict, when the, <clears throat> the will of man and the will of God are in conflict, we obey God every time. Okay? Nancy Kennedy asks, do you see a greater armoring of people lately for the new battle. <clears throat> Maybe a little. I think there's an awakening to the need for it. So that's a start. That's where it starts. But I think we're going to see a whole lot more as things unfold. And a uh, great question. <clears throat> Trisha Troskler asks, how can the church be more understanding toward battered women? The church now, God hates divorce and tells women to forgive and take abusers back. Is a woman's, I'm sorry, some of that was cut off. But yeah, that's a try. We should maybe be more understand towards any battered person, <clears throat> man, woman, child. But, you know, one thing I, I think. You know, if if you're a battered woman, you're probably where the healing for battered women are going to come from. You know, there's a spiritual principle where the Lord was struck. It says, by his stripes, we are healed. The very place where he was wounded, he received authority for healing us. And the same is true for us, which we see going all the way back to Exodus and other places. The Lord doesn't... He's not the one who does the wounding, but he allows it. It could not happen if God did not allow it. Satan can't get a shot in when God isn't looking. So if he allowed something really bad like that to happen in your life, he allowed it in order to give you authority for healing others of that same wound. And <clears throat> so don't feel sorry for yourself. Self-pity is one of the primary robbers of our purpose and our destiny. It says God causes all things to work together for good. So we can be thankful for even the abuse that we had. When you start doing that, you start getting healed. You see a higher purpose and you start getting healed, but you have to be healed. In the Old Testament, the priest could not have scabs, which were unhealed wounds. That would disqualify them from the priesthood. And if you're carrying around continued wounding because of this, you, you can't be a healer. So you need to get healed first. And this is an important thing because there's so many battered like this. You need to get healed first. Once you get healed, and th that healing comes through the cross, which basically is forgiveness, true and total forgiveness, 
and you can become a healer. And that's the reason the Lord allowed it to happen to you in the first place. But I hope that helps. Great question. What are some of the books you've read in your life that have had the most impact other than the Bible? Of course, some of the books. Now, I, boy, I, really, I love the Russians. And, you know, this may, uh, <clears throat> if you get on, I do, I'm trying to do Facebook Live, little personal thing every day, and I'm going to talk some coming up about Putin and, and Russia and all. And the people who know Putin the, the closest, who really know him, one friend of ours who was at our New Year's conference and shared some, it's one of Putin's best friends. Putin had called him last week. And... Uh, you get a very different perspective of this guy than what comes out in our media. But I have an affinity for the Russians, I admit. I love Russia. I love Russian history. Um, <clears throat> it is awesome. That is an awesome people. And the Russian writers, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Chekhov, the Russian composers, Tchaikovsky and... I mean, there is a depth and a power and um, a breadth of wisdom and vision that is just uncommon in any kind of literature I've ever found anywhere else. Solzhenitsyn in recent times, put him in that same category. Unbelievable prophetic insight in those guys, too. And uh, so I grew up, I discovered the Russians... Russian authors when I was like 15 years old and I started reading Tolstoy and I read all of his books a few times, some of them. War and Peace is you know, his greatest, best-known classic. And it's, it's one of the thickest books, but it's one I remember I never wanted to end. Oh, I wish he had made it bigger. And, uh, you know, just, I don't know, someone once said, once wrote, the world has never been discerned never been seen by a more discerning eye than that of Leo Tolstoy. And I may have to agree with that, except for Jesus, of course, maybe some of the prophets, but Tolstoy was a prophet, no question, the prophetic anointing on his life. And, um, <clears throat> but he could take two pages and you are sometimes a page, and it's like you would know that person he's talking about or describing better than if you'd known them in real life for 10 years. Just the insight and the, the depth with which he wrote. And some of the most profound issues that he addressed through those books. And uh, in those books that were, I still don't know how you would do it any more profoundly than they did. So, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm captivated. Always have been with some of the Russians. I love the Russian people. I love Russia. You know, almost every, we've got a lot of Russians in our church here. They are some of the happiest, most delightful people. Now, I've met a lot of Russians all over the, the world, and they almost all seem that way. And, um, I don't know, there's something about the Russian culture, but it also captivated me when I was a new Christian. I was shown that the greatest revival in the church age was going to come from Russia, come in Russia, come through Russia. And uh, later I read two or three other historical writers who said the same thing in their writings, like they had that same revelation. Something's going to come out of Russia at the end that's going to be unbelievable. I think the greatest revival may be in the church age. And uh, so that's got my attention on Russia, too. Now, I also think a lot of the Chinese. Um, I was shown that the capital of Christianity was going to kind of move from the U.S. to China. It's moving. I don't know if you followed it. It's moved from west to east throughout its history, where there would be kind of a center of the new thought and the present revelation in Christianity moved from place to place around the world. It's been going from west to east 
I'm sorry, east to west. I said west to east, east to west. And that next is it's going to find a home in China. And I was shown that China and the Chinese Christians were going to be like a great filter. They're going to really purify the doctrine of the church and the the manifestation of church and church life. And I'm excited about that, but it's moving back towards Jerusalem. It's going to end up all the way back in Jerusalem, where Jerusalem will again be the center of Christianity in the earth. So I, I love the the Chinese too, and I'm looking for them to have hope and expectancy in them. And then, you know, I read so much. I read constantly. It's It dominates my days. I am just always reading and studying, researching, and I wouldn't even know where to go. And, you know, I, I love some of the present writers. I like, you know, I read everything Mike Bickle puts out. Francis Frangipan, incredible author with depth and substance and life anointing on his revelation. There's, uh, I mean, just so many others that are, are out there. And I do tend to read more than listen to preaching. I love preaching too. Love great preaching. But, um, you know, I mentioned my Facebook Live yesterday how wise it was when James Baker became the chief of staff for President Reagan. When he was, James Baker was asked how he's going to do his job, what are you going to do to prepare for this job? He said, well, the first thing I got to do is to find out how President Reagan best processes information and get it to him in that form. And he found out he, Reagan tended to absorb information better when it came in conversation and in meetings. And he would get it to him in that form, bring somebody in to share the information instead of just giving him a paper on it. Now, that was one example. Now, I'm the opposite. People sit down, they want to share their vi their vision with me, and it's just, you know, it's hard for me to receive through that gate, my ear gate, than it is for, for me to read something. So I try to get things in bullet point, vision, you know, that form, and read it, and that's how I process information better. I noticed on my Facebook, when I started doing the live, I started hearing from so many people saying, and I appreciate you get on Facebook, but I can get, I receive it so much better when you share it on the live, when you're sharing and talking, than I do reading it. And then I've got plenty who they want to read it, like I, I do. I tend to be that people are different. God made us different. That's why I think we have the written word and the preached word, and we need a balance of both. Not 50-50, maybe. It could be where I'm 65% reading and 35% you know, listening and hearing, but something like that. But God made us all different. So, but I love to read. And I'm so thankful for books. One of my visions of heaven is just a giant library. And guess what? He showed me that's really a part of it. The books of life. We're going to be forever reading these things and learning from them. They are revelation from God and of God. And... The best revelation of all comes in the way he has interchanged with men. Just reveals who he is. Be no greater revelation ever than the cross. Never. Than him becoming a man and living among us. That's why he's called the Lamb throughout eternity, it looks like in the book of Revelation. And how could it be a greater revelation of him than what he did there for us? But I also, I, I just love to read stuff. So that's the way he made me. But that's why I'm trying to do Facebook in both things. And I do Facebook. We had a reach last year of 82.5 million people on Facebook. So I feel like every day I share on that, I'm able to maybe reach a million people, like preaching to a million people. And uh, so, I, you know, I give a lot of my time to that. If you don't do Facebook, I would encourage you to. It's really easy to get on, understand, set up your own thing. Really simple, really easy. And you can communicate with the world instantly. People get on there and share their comments after my post. Those comments can reach hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, it's almost unlimited how many they could 
reach. You don't know, and where else do you have a platform like that? So um, let's take advantage. I believe that is the present modern pulpit. Not Facebook necessarily, but social media in general. Twitter. <coughs> Donald Trump has shaken up Washington with Twitter. It's interesting to me, they uh, interviewed a lobbyist the other day. And they were asking, what is your greatest fear about the changes Donald Trump is bringing to Washington? Because he's he said he's going to drain the swamp. They said, our greatest fear is that he's going to attack us on Twitter. Can you imagine that? That's their greatest fear. That's the kind of power he is now wielding through that pulpit. You know, the president's said to have had, had to have a bully pulpit. And he gets up there and says something. It's going to shake the world. Trump can do it directly. He can bypass the media and everything else. And I tell you, the media greatly fears Donald Trump's wrath through Twitter. It has an impact, major impact. That's an amazing thing for our president to have that kind of direct communication with the people. You can have that. You can get on Donald Trump's site and put your comments in there. Millions could read them. What a day. That's true. The devil's in there fighting like anything to try to take dominion over that, but don't let him. Get on there and do it. Be the salt and light you're called to be and run him out of town. Well, anyway, I've enjoyed doing these couple of services like this, and I want to finish by praying for you, and and uh, thank you for joining us. And please do, if you would consider, if you're on Facebook Live receiving this, if you look right down at the bottom where it says share, if you just hit that, it will share this with all the people you know, that you've reached through Facebook, and it's a way to spread it out to more people. Really appreciate you doing that. Or hitting the likes. The more likes on there, the more it goes out and everything. And, of course, you can hit don't like, I guess, too. But uh, but anyway, thank you so much for joining us. And, and Lord, I pray for all these hungry people that uh, spend this time just seeking to hear from you, seeking to hear something about you, or have a hunger for you that way. And we ask you for, I ask you for the greatest gift of all, more hunger for you and more love for you. Where Paul the Apostle said, the love of Christ controls us. Where this could really be said of us. Because Lord, we there is nothing more lovable in this creation than you, the Creator. And Lord, we ask you, let us see you more clearly. And Lord, let us, if we see you, we're going to become like you and we're going to love you more. And I ask you to make us contagious with that love for you. Where everywhere we go, we infect everybody with the love of God and love for God. <clears throat> Lord, your son, Jesus prayed that the love wherewith you loved him would be in us. He prayed that as last night. We ask you... Make us the fulfillment for your son Jesus' prayer. Give us your love for your son Jesus and make us contagious with it. And I pray for every one of these for 2017. Where you said the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter until the full day. That the path of these who are seeking the righteousness of God, seeking your righteousness, seeking it first, would walk that path that just keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter until we have the fullness of the light. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today.